<clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Let's take our Bibles this morning, if we can, and open them to the book of Genesis, chapter 27. And verse 18, trying to look uh, this morning, Lord willing, at verses 18 through 29, the title of our message this morning is Betrayed by a Kiss. Betrayed by a Kiss. We are now in, in the book of Genesis, the Jacob section where... Jacob is prominent, and um, last week we studied Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 17, where we saw Isaac's intent to bless the firstborn, Esau. We saw a conspiracy develop, verses 5 through 17, between Jacob and Rebecca, his mother, to seek to um, deceive Isaac, so to speak, so the blessing would fall not on Esau, but on Jacob. And as we take a look this morning at verses 18 through 29, we see the actual plan being executed. We have deception, verses 18 through 27, and then beginning about the second part of verse 27, going through verse 29, we see the actual blessing coming to not Esau, but Jacob by way of deception. Notice, uh, first of all, the deception itself. You have Jacob's entrance there in verse 18. It says, Then he came to his father and said to his father, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Here we have uh, Jacob, disguised as Esau, sort of taking advantage of Isaac in his declining years, with his declining eyesight, we have, in other words, the secondborn, Jacob, pretending to be the firstborn, Esau. And beginning in verse 19, you have Jacob's first lie to his father. Verse 19, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. No, you're not. Sorry, I just added that. I have done as you told me, get up please and sit and eat of my game that you may bless me. The sin that is taking place here is not in Jacob wanting the blessing. The sin is really deception. And the reason I say that is because there actually was a clear word from the Lord back in Genesis 25, 23, where it said, the older shall serve the younger. It was God's intention from that point for the blessing to come upon Jacob. So the sin wasn't so much in desiring the blessing on the part of Jacob, it was the sin of lying about it. It was the sin of deception. Arnold Fruchtenbaum sums it up this way. He says, so Jacob lied and his deception of his father was indeed sinful. That is where Jacob's sin lay. It should be noted that the sin is not stealing of the patriarchal blessing but the deception of the father. <clears throat> However, what Isaac and Esau were trying to do was actually more sinful because they were trying to thwart the very purposes of God. Isaac, of course, should have known better. He was the, along with his wife, the recipient of Genesis 25, 23. He should have blessed Jacob instead of Esau, but as we saw last week, Isaac is um, sort of following the world's way of doing things, 
not God's way of doing things, and he was going to bless the firstborn, not the one that God said the blessing is to be bestowed upon. And so what happens here is really a parameter of lies. Jacob tells his first lie, verse 19. He tells his second lie, verse 20. He tells his third lie, verse 24. It is interesting that when we tell a lie, sometimes the greater lie is the second lie that we have to manufacture to explain away the first lie. Um, many times the greatest scandals in the area of business or in the area of politics happen, and it's not so much the initial lie that's the problem, it's the cover-up in the second lie trying to cover up for the first lie. This is why the Bible exhorts us to be people of truthfulness. Uh, one lie very easily leads to a more severe lie. We think the first lie is sort of innocent. We misname it, of course, kind of a white lie, an innocuous lie, a harmless lie, but it really sets us down a path where we now have to cover up things just to explain away the first lie. And many times the second lie, the third lie, the fourth lie, etc. put us into a worse position. How much easier our lives would be if we would just be honest out of the gate. We would save ourselves so much grief. We would save ourselves so much heartache. And Jacob, unfortunately, is not following that admonition. And so we read about his second lie right there in verse 20. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have it so quickly? So, Jacob's second lie is right there in verse 20. Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have it so quickly? Going back to verse 19, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up. Please sit and eat of my game that you may bless me. Then verse 20, Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have it so quickly? You'll notice here that Isaac is a little bit suspicious of what's going on. Isaac is sort of declining, as we said before. His eyesight is in a state of decline. And he kind of senses that something is not right. He had sent Esau out to get game to prepare the meal. And yet here Esau... And this is not Esau, this is Jacob, disguised as Esau, comes back so quickly and Isaac kind of senses something isn't right. How, do, how is it that you have the game and the meal so fast? I call that kind of thing a check in the spirit. Many times the Lord, I think, will do this for us through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Something isn't right, and you'll sort of receive something from God, a quick check in the Spirit saying, ah, something is not right here. And many times we really don't trust our first impressions of things, and we go ahead. But I would say if you have a check in the Spirit about something, a, a business deal, a relationship, whatever it is, that could be a signal from the Lord himself that something is not quite right and you ought to sort of back up, slow down, and examine things very, very carefully. Many times in my life concerning different situations, I've received sort of a check in the spirit and I haven't wanted to listen to it because I really don't trust it. I trust other things. But I think many times the check in the spirit is actually a gift from God himself. So if you're on the precipice today of making some kind of decision, some kind of move, and there's a little check in your spirit about that, I guess my exhortation to you is to pay attention to that. But you see how the lie continues to unfold, and it says, and he, that's Jacob, 
masquerading as Esau before an elderly Isaac. And he said, because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me. Why are you back so quickly? Well, it was God that helped me. So you can see how the lies are progressing here. This is actually a worse lie because he's involving God in it. I mean, the Lord did it. Well, no, the Lord didn't do that because the Lord is not the author of confusion and he is not the author of uh, deception. But many times as Christians, we do this. We get involved in deception or trickery and then we, then we try to blame it on God. Hey, sorry I couldn't keep my word to make my commitment to you, my meeting with you. The Lord led me elsewhere. When in reality, the Lord really didn't lead me elsewhere. I had just forgotten about the meeting. I mean, we, we play this uh, little game where we kind of spiritualize and sanctify our bad choices with biblical terminology and that's actually a worse form of lying because we're involving God in the deception itself. So he's using God's name here as part of this deception. And Isaac, I don't think at this point is completely buying it because we have Isaac involved now in sort of a test, verses 21 through 23. We see suspicion Verse 21, deception, verse 22, the reason for the deception, verse 23, and the result, verse uh, 23. Notice, uh, if you will, verse 21. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come close that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. Isaac is a little bit more suspicious. Check in the spirit, something that we should pay attention to. And he knows that Esau is a hairy man and Isaac is a, uh, uh, excuse me, Esau is a hairy man and Jacob rather is a smooth man. We see that back in verse 11. Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, behold, Esau, my brother is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. And so that's why. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, put the skins, the garments of skin on Jacob to convince Isaac that it really wasn't Jacob, but it was Esau because Jacob is smooth and Esau is a little bit more hairy. So Isaac is sort of suspicious. And then because we don't pay attention to the check in our spirit, the deception manifests itself, which you can see there in verse 22. So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, this is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So now we have a successful deception. And what's interesting here about Isaac, who is being deceived, is he allowed one area of his senses to override another area. Isaac allowed touch to overshadow his hearing. Charles Ryrie in the Ryrie Study Bible puts it this way, Jacob had to resort to lying and Isaac allowed his senses of touch, taste, and smell to overrule what he heard. The blessing included both the benediction and the prediction. So Isaac hears something, but he allows another sense, his sense of touch, to overrule what he is hearing. And I'm here to tell you folks that this is how many, many people are deceived. And here I'm talking about allowing our senses to override what the Bible says. Many people, to a very large extent, are not looking at the Bible. Or when they look at the Bible, they want to sort of override what the Bible says with how they're feeling at a particular moment. Gee, um, I don't think I'm going to be involved in an adulterous relationship because, because the Bible 
says thou shalt not commit adultery. But he or she makes me feel a certain way. And so I'm going to substitute my feelings for what Scripture actually says. That, in actuality, is how deception manifests um, itself. This is something we need to pay attention to, because if I'm understanding Jesus correctly, as we move to the end of the age, uh, what, in essence, we discover is that false Christs and deception will increase. This is a list of the different birth pangs in Matthew 24, leading up to the return of Christ, the disciples asked the Lord, what's it going to be like when you come back? And Jesus gave a list of signs, and the very first sign he drew their attention to was deception because of false Christs. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5, it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And will mislead many. Deception is not going to decrease. Deception is going to increase as we get closer to the end of the age. And how exactly are people deceived? They substitute what God says for one of their senses. Isaac is substituting his hearing for what he can feel. Psalm 119, verse 105, puts it this way. Your word is a what? Lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God, what is it at the end of the day? It's like a lamp. It's like a light. We would be stumbling around. We would be groping around in darkness if we didn't have the light of God's word. And that's how you live your life as a Christian. You live your life as a Christian by the propositional statements of God. When God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, that's what it says, and that's what he means. And we fall into deception when I substitute how someone makes me feel in lieu of or in exchange for what the Bible actually says. The Bible is a lot like a compass in an airline or an airplane for an airplane pilot. And we have pilots in our church, and many of them have told me this, that when you fly a plane, you always look at what the compass says. The compass is objectively true. The compass itself will not lie to you. And I have had pilots tell me that sometimes the airplane feels like it's flying upside down. And every inclination in their being is to sort of right the wrong based on what they feel. But if they did that, the plane, of course, would, would go down. The plane would crash. You cannot live your life or fly as a pilot based on your feelings you have to look at what's objectively true on the compass. The compass will tell you if you're flying upside down or not, regardless of how you feel. And that's how the Christian life is lived. You live by the propositional statements of God's word. And the moment we begin to substitute our feelings for what God says is the moment our plane as Christians crashes as well. Countless Christian lives have been wrecked because they are ignoring the principle that we're talking about here. They do not understand the anatomy of deception, which we spoke of last time. It's very easy for us to be deceived. And if you as a Christian don't think you can be deceived, then you're already deceived. Because Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, says to Christians, Brethren, do not be deceived. So that raises an interesting question. How do we get deceived? We get deceived because the Bible takes less priority than how we feel at any given moment. 
feelings can be very deceptive. Isaac here is not paying attention to the check in his spirit, and he is substituting one sense for another, and he's moving here off into, um, off into deception. You have the reason why all of this is happening there in verse 23. It says, he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So this feels right. The voice is off. And it's kind of weird that you came back so fast with the game. But what I'm trusting here with my hands and feeling, it feels right. What does the Bible say? It says there is a way that seems right to a man, but ends there in death or destruction. It is so easy to get your eyes off the compass and move on to feelings at the moment and trust those instead of the propositional statements of God's word. And then we have verse 23, which is the result of all of these things. Second part of verse 23. So he, that's Isaac, blessed him, that's Jacob, disguised here as Esau. So he blessed him. And that was the result that uh, Jacob and Rebekah were seeking in this conspiracy that they were weaving. This is what they wanted. Now again, keep in mind that the sin here is not the patriarchal blessing going to Jacob. That should have happened anyway. And I believe that if um, Isaac, excuse me, Rebekah and Jacob had just simply backed off and allowed the Lord to work things out in his timing, the blessing would have fallen on the right person. But they didn't do that. They sort of forced things. They suffered, as we're going to see, many consequences because of this. And so the sin was not so much in achieving the patriarchal blessing. It was the deception involved. And the, the lying doesn't stop there because as you go down to verse 24, you see more lying. In fact, this is Jacob's third lie. He said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. One of the things about lying is once you start to lie and be deceptive and you do it the very first time, it becomes a lot easier to do it the second time and the third time. Uh, this is what I would call the, de the deceptive nature of sin. Sin will market itself to us. Sin will advertise itself to us. And the first time we sin, we're so convicted by it bothers us, but the second time around, it's a little easier if we yield to it. The third time around, it's a little bit easier. The fourth time around, it's a little easier. And you see this in Jacob's sort of progression or degression, I guess I should say, downward, is the lies seem to be coming a lot more easy, and the reason for that is his conscience is being seared. What is conscience? Conscience, the word con with science knowledge, conscience, essentially is a barometer that God has put into the hearts of all people, his commandments. A lot of people know the commandments of God without ever having read the Bible because God has put his word and his law and his commandments actually into the hearts of all people. You'll see the book of Romans talking about that in Romans 2 verses 14 and 15 and how the consciences of people are either violated or validated based on decisions that they make. And if you don't believe that conscience exists in all people, all you have to do is run a little experiment at home with your two kids, if you've got two, roughly the same age. You tell kid A, hey, if you take out the trash and empty the dishwasher, I'll take you over to Denny's. 
you tell kid B, who's listening to what you just said to kid A, hey, if you, uh, what did I say, empty the dishwasher and whatever else I said, take out the trash, there we go. I'll take you to Disney World. And kid A, when he hears what you just said to kid B, is going to say, that's not, that's not fair. Well, who in the world ever gave you the idea that things are supposed to be fair? I mean, how is it that little kids instinctively are aware of unfairness? That's conscience. That's the law of God revealed into the hearts of all people. Conscience can be an absolutely wonderful thing. It's a lot like walking on the sand on the beach and there's glass, broken glass, let's say, underneath the sand. And you start to walk on the beach and you walk on some broken glass, not seeing it, and suddenly your foot hurts. Ouch. That's not the enemy, that's your friend. Because the body is telling you if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to do a lot of damage to your feet. Uh, a hand on a hot stove is not necessarily the enemy, it's your friend. Because as your hand is on that hot stove, all of a sudden your hand hurts and you pull your hand off the hot stove so you don't destroy your hand. That's how conscience works. That's why God has put conscience into the hearts of all people. This is why all people instinctively know that they're guilty before God. They have maybe never read Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. But they know they're guilty before God. Because God has put his laws into their hearts. Romans 2 verses 14 and 15. The problem is when you keep violating conscience. The detection that conscience gives. Starts to lose its power. The pain you know that you feel as you're walking on the beach by way of analogy to conscience, the pain becomes a little bit less and less and less. Hey, uh, I went ahead and committed a sin. I feel terrible about it. But the next time around, if I commit the same sin, I, I feel bad, but not quite as bad. The third time around, yeah, I feel a little bit bad, but not as bad as time number one and time number two. That's the deadening of conscience. This is why Jacob's lies are becoming more overt as this deception is continuing. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 concerning conscience says, By means of hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience... As with a branding iron. Paul, of course, knows all about conscience. He wrote about it in Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. But he says here, a person's conscience can be seared as with a hot iron. And this actually can happen to people. Uh, I remember in the state of California back um, in the early 90s, and this was a big deal because they finally brought back for a season capital punishment against this particular individual that committed this crime, but he had come up to, in a public park, two children, and he strangled them to death in cold blood. And then he sat down, and they were eating McDonald's and things like that. He sat down and finished their food after they were strangled to death. Now, what do you do with someone like that? You, you, the way to understand them is they have violated conscience so frequently that it's lost its ability to be a guide to them. They've lost their moral way. And this becomes the problem of the deceitfulness of sin, sinning over and over and over and over again is the power of conscience itself starts to lose its potency. And I believe you're seeing that here with, with Jacob. Verse 24, he said, are you really my son? And he said, I am. And then the meal that has been prepared by Jacob and his mother, Rebekah, 
is now offered to Isaac. And notice, if you will, verse, uh, verse 25. And he said, bring it to me, and I will eat of my son's game that I may bless you. And he brought it to him, and he ate, and he also brought him wine, and he drank. So Isaac is eating the meal. Isaac is substituting the check in the spirit for what feels right to him. Isaac is substituting what he hears for what he can touch. It's just a, a case study on deception, how people are deceived. Substituting what they know is right for what at any moment they can they can feel. And hence the title of this sermon, Betrayed by a Kiss, you see that there at the end of verse 26 and into verse 27. Verse 27 of Genesis 27. So he came close and kissed him. Back in verse 26, it says, Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come close and kiss me, my son. Betrayed by a kiss. We don't have to think far in the Bible to come up with examples of people who are betrayed by a kiss. Jesus Christ himself was betrayed by the kiss of Judas. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, it says, Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said to him, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Luke's account, Luke 22, verses 47 and 48, says, While he was speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Betrayal through flattery, in other words. Betrayed by somebody who says, I love you. This, uh, of course, is something that happened with Joab in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 20. In verse 9, it says, jo Joab said to Amazah, It is well with you, is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amazah by the beard with his right hand to kiss him, betrayed by a kiss. I remember very early on in my ministry, I was trying to pastor a little church in Pico Rivera, California, and there was a lady in that particular church who was what we would call one of the revered saints. You know, she had been there for a long time. She had walked with the Lord for a long time. When she spoke, I always listened to what she was saying because of her walk with the Lord. And she told me very clearly at the beginning of my ministry, she said, you know, it's not going to be the unsaved world that hurts, that hurts you. Your biggest hurts are going to come from fellow Christians, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And you ask yourself, well, why is that true? It's true because we trust our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And when one of them does us a dirty or stabs us in the back, we're really not in a place where we're guarding ourselves against it. You know, it's kind of like uh, the, the great, um, I don't know if I would call him a magician, but he was an escape artist, Harry Houdini. And you remember how he died he told anybody, just come up and I can flex my muscles a certain way in my stomach and you can hit me in the stomach and hit me as hard as you want in the stomach. Once I flex my muscles, my stomach's not going to be in pain. Your fist is going to be in pain. And you remember what happened is someone came up to him and hit him without him having a chance to flex his muscles in his stomach. That's essentially how Harry Houdini died. And he said, why, why did you do that? I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. 
That is something that very easily happens in the body of Christ because all of us in the body of Christ still have a sin nature. People say, I don't want to join that church down the street. It's filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And our response is, well, we always have room for one more hypocrite. And so when your brothers and sisters in Christ do something to you, you're, it kind of completely takes you off guard. You're not really ready. Uh, your stomach muscles aren't flexed properly. Your defenses aren't up the way they would be amongst the unsaved world. And the Christian can hurt you. This is the kind of thing that's happening here. Why there are so many examples of betrayed by a kiss uh, in Scripture. In fact, Jesus was betrayed by his inner circle. You read Christ's interaction with Judas, and you'll see Jesus calling Judas friend right till the very end. Jesus looked at Judas as a friend. And that's why the, the knife cut so deeply when he was betrayed for a mere 30 pieces of silver by Judas. There's something that happened in Caesarea Philippi as Jesus is interacting with Peter, also part of Jesus' inner circle. It says in Matthew 16, 21 through 23, for from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter. Who is Peter? He's part of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. In other words, his best friend is trying to talk him out of his mission of dying on the cross. But he, that's Jesus, turned and said to Peter, get behind me, what? Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's interests. Why in the world would Satan choose Peter's mouth to try to talk Jesus out of his mission? The answer is, when Jesus was around Peter, he looked at him as part of the inner circle. And I believe Satan reasoned that Jesus would be more vulnerable to a temptation coming from Peter rather than someone from the outside. So as you interact with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, this is just something to be aware of. As many times the most trusted people that you know could be saying things and doing things regarding you that are not in your best interest. And then you have to put the shoe on the other foot also. If Satan can work through fellow Christians, and I think there's evidence that he can, I don't want to be one of those Christians that he works through. I mean, I don't want my lips to be used to tear someone down or advise them to do something that God doesn't want when they have brought me into their inner circle. And so you'll notice here that the betrayal takes place through a kiss. You notice the second part of verse 27, it says, When he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him. What, what could go wrong here? I mean, he smells like Esau and not Jacob. Why, why does he smell like Esau? Because that's part of the deception. They put on Jacob Esau's clothing. Verse 15, going back to chapter 27, verse 15, it says, Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, the younger son. Esau was a hunter. Jacob was not. And so here's how we're going to overcome this. According to this conspiracy, we're going to put 
Esau's clothes on Jacob. So that way when Jacob gets close to Isaac, Isaac will smell Esau, not Jacob. So you'll notice that Isaac is relying upon smell. He is relying upon touch. He is not relying upon what he hears. He's certainly not relying upon his sight because it's in decline. And because he's substituting feelings for other things, other checks in the spirit that he is experiencing, he is in a state of deception. Just a warning to everyone in these last days, stay close to the Lord. Stay close to his word. Understand that a church can let you down. A Christian can let you down. A pastor can let you down. An elder board can let you down. Deacons can let you down. But this book that's objectively true, coming from a God that cannot lie, this will never let you down. When rightfully understood, it becomes a, as Psalm 119 verse 105 says, a lamp shining in a dark place. So now that Isaac is in this state of deception, he's now ready to give the blessing to Jacob rather than Esau, thinking it's actually Esau. And we're going to conclude here with the blessing itself. We have the blessings of God, verse 27, agricultural blessings, verse 28. Blessings related to lordship, first part of verse 29. And then as the verses were read earlier, you might correlate that with Genesis 12, verse 3, which is in the Abrahamic covenant, where it was promised, I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. Notice, first of all, the, the, the blessings of God. You see that there in verse 27. So he came close and kissed him, and when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See the smell of my son, it is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. So here come the blessings, and the blessings are twofold. They are agricultural, and secondly, they're related to lordship, as we'll talk about in a second. And third, they're related to this blessing and cursing aspect of the Abrahamic covenant. Notice the agricultural blessings. Those are described there in verse 28. Now, here's the blessing. God gave you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and the abundance of grain, new wine. So there are basically three um, agricultural blessings here. Number one, the dew of heaven. Number two, the fatness of the earth. And number three, plenty of grain and wine. And it's interesting that the blessing is falling upon Jacob rather than Esau here. Yet those were the material things that Esau was most likely interested in. This is why he was very upset. As we're going to read subsequently in the chapter beginning next week, why he did not receive the blessing himself. He wanted these material things. And yet the material things were falling upon Jacob rather than Esau because of this deception. Part of the blessing also dealt with blessings related to lordship. Authority is what I'm speaking of. And it's right there in verse 29. Many peoples serve you and nations will bow down to you. It goes on and it says, be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. So these lordship type blessings, we can divide it into two. There are blessings related, first of all, to the nations. Again, verse 29, many peoples serve you and nations will bow down to you. What is this speaking of? This is speaking of the fact that once God completes his total work 
in and through the nation of Israel, as is promised in the Abrahamic covenant, then the nation of Israel will be in a place of preeminence and authority over the other nations of the earth. See, the thousand-year kingdom is not just, hey, it's going to be great, all the nations will be there. They'll be there, and it's going to be great. But what you have to understand is tiny Israel that is rejected by the world system today, the tiny city of Jerusalem that is rejected and trampled on by the world system today will be in a place of authority over the other nations. And certainly other Bible prophecies teach this very clearly. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 18 says, and this is a millennial, 1,000 year reign type of prophecy. It says, then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth that does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain for them. If the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall upon them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Obviously, a passage has never been fulfilled. Speaking of the fact that when God brings his kingdom reign to planet Earth during the thousand-year reign subsequent to the personal return of Jesus Christ, Israel will be there, but she will be in a state of preeminence over the other nations. The city of Jerusalem will be there, but not like it is today. It will be in a statement of preeminence over the other nations. You want to talk about a teaching that is lost in the Gentile-dominated church today. This is it. Because a lot of people say this, Oh yeah, I believe in a future for Israel. Meaning that Israel is just one of many nations in the Millennial Kingdom. That's not what this prophecy says. Israel is in a place of preeminence, prominence over the other nations. And if you have something in your mind of anti-Semitic thought, anti-Jewish thought, you're you're not going to like this doctrine at all. The preeminence of Israel and Jerusalem in the thousand-year kingdom. Isaiah chapter 49 And verse 22. And I don't think I'm going to be able to read Isaiah 49. Oh, there it is. My page is open. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 22. It says, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my standard to the peoples, and they will bring their sons in their bosom, and daughters will be carried on their shoulders. Verse 23, Kings will be your guardian, and their princesses your nurse, and they, who's the they? It's the Gentile nations will bow down with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet. And you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. This is God's program for the nation of Israel. And if there's something in your mind or your thought process that's anti-Semitic, believe me, this is not a teaching that you're going to be comfortable with, and yet it's completely biblical. Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, speaking of the millennial preeminence of Israel and Jerusalem in the thousand-year kingdom, says, The Lord, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. 
Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief mountain and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. This is speaking in context of Jerusalem being raised topographically above the other nations. And many peoples will come and say, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Washington, D.C. Whoops, doesn't say that. For the law will go forth from Zion, synonym for Jerusalem, And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he, that's Jesus, in Jerusalem, will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up nation. Nation will not lift up sword, rather, against nation, and never again will they learn of war. By the way, as you probably know, this is inscribed, this verse here, on United Nations property in New York. In other words, the United Nations has assumed a messianic complex. They think they're the ones that are going to bring in these prophecies of peace, world peace. The problem is... Since the foundation of the United Nations, there have been more wars and not less. So I'd venture to say that the United Nations is not all it's cracked up to be. And there's certainly no Messiah. Because this is indicating that these prophecies won't come into existence until Jesus, following the tribulation period, rules this world with a rod of righteousness from David's throne in Jerusalem. In fact, the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, I think it is, um, about verse 23, speaks also to the preeminence of the nation of Israel in the millennial kingdom. When it says, thus says the Lord of hosts in those days, ten men from all the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. These types of texts are hardly ever preached on in the modern church, because we think the whole program revolves around us, the church. Now, don't get me wrong, you won't be disappointed once the millennium begins, according to other passages Like Revelation 5, verse 10, you'll be ruling and reigning, but you have to understand something, that God has not forgotten his promises to Israel. All of these promises will indeed materialize. And when it says there in verse 29, as the blessing is now coming upon Jacob, Many peoples will serve you and the nations will bow down to you. These are prophecies that will find their fulfillment and realization in the millennial reign of Christ. Now certainly, if theologians don't accept this, the devil does. The devil knows these prophecies very well. Because Satan, at the end of the thousand years, is going to be put into a place called the abyss... And at the end of the thousand years, he's going to be let loose, one last hurrah. And his first order of business is to attack the city of Jerusalem. Why in the world would the devil, after a thousand years of solitary confinement, lead an attack against Jerusalem the moment he's let out of the abyss The answer is he knows prophecy and he understands that Israel and Jerusalem is the nerve center or the headquarters of Jesus or Yeshua during the millennial kingdom. And so Satan gathers a rebel army and comes against Jerusalem. It says in Revelation 27 through 9, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison 
He will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they come up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, watch this, and the beloved city. Do a word study on beloved city in the Psalms. You'll see it always refers to Jerusalem. Fortunately, he doesn't get far because the rest of verse 9 says, And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Satan himself understands the preeminence of the Jewish people in the millennium. That's why he attacks Jerusalem at the end of the thousand years. Robert Thomas, speaking of this verse or verses, properly says, At the end of the millennium, that city, Jerusalem, will be Satan's prime objective with his rebel army because Israel will be leader again among the nations. I mean, why, why believe that Jerusalem is going to be leader again among the nations? Because of prophecies like this that are going to Jacob that are being uttered. Many peoples will serve you and nations will bow down to you. This is the origin of of these prophecies and promises that wait a, await a millennial fulfillment. And then dealing with this subject of authority, the brethren will be in submission to you. Second part of verse 29, be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. God already prophesied this would happen concerning Jacob the second born, when it said the older, that's Esau, shall serve the younger. Why does God keep doing this in the Bible? Why does God, particularly in the book of Genesis, when two are born, why does he favor the opposite, the way the world works? I mean, the older is supposed to have the rights of the firstborn. God says, I'm going to reverse things and it's going to be the older that will serve the younger. Why does God keep doing this? And you'll see this pattern over and over again in the book of Genesis. The selection of the younger over the older pattern. Abel over Cain. Seth over Cain. Shem and Joppeth, excuse me, Shem over Joppeth, Noah's sons. Isaac over Ishmael. Jacob over Esau. Judah and Joseph over their brothers, and at the very end of the book of Genesis, we'll see Ephraim over Manasseh. Why does this pattern keep happening? And that's a great way to study the Bible, by the way. When you see a pattern recurring, it's something that the Holy Spirit is seeking to draw your attention to. The reason for this pattern is God is saying, I'm the boss, I'm sovereign. I'm the big cheese, so to speak. Yeah, I know the world system works its own way. It favors the firstborn. But I'm going to set aside the world system because I'm God and I, I'm allowed to do that. And by the way, when you go into the land of Canaan and you see giants in the land and you feel overwhelmed, as this will be written and given to the Joshua generation, don't hit the panic button. Because I'm sovereign over those giants. As evidenced by my sovereignty over the world system, as over and over again, we have the selection of the younger over the older in the outworking of God's purposes. Well, how does this relate to us today, Pastor, in the 21st century? As you're walking through circumstances, you don't have to be overwhelmed by those. You just have to remember that God is in charge. If God has called you to do something, it doesn't matter the size of the obstacle. God is sovereign, and as long as you're connected to him and walking under his superintendence, then the struggles in your life are manageable. And once you see that, the level of anxiety that we typically experience when we run into things bigger than us that anxiety starts to dissipate. So there are prophecies here concerning agricultural, 
agriculture, lordship related to nations and the brethren, and then it sort of ends with one more promise or prophecy coming from Isaac to Jacob concerning blessings and curses. I'm at the very end of verse 29, our final verse. It says, Cursed be those who curse you, and blessed be the one who blesses you. You say, well, Pastor, I, we've read that before, haven't we? And indeed we have. It's what God said to the patriarch Abram when he was forming through him the new nation of Israel. He said, I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. I'm going to bless the world through you, Abraham. That's what it says at the end of verse 3. And the moment God uttered that, God knew that the devil would come against this blessing. Because if you can stop this blessing, you can stop the blessings of God from spilling over to the Jewish people to the rest of the world. See, it's a dangerous thing to be blessed by God. Because the moment you're blessed by God is now the moment that Satan is now trying to destroy your life. Because he's trying to destroy the instrument through which the blessing comes. And so God gave, knowing this, to Abram another blessing, or another promise, I should say. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. We've made reference to the different Hebrew words there. The one who curses you, kalal, I will curse, aror, if I'm pronouncing that right. The first one is a light offense. The second word is a heavy offense. In other words, if you lightly come against Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Jewish nation, God obligates himself to bring against a person a heavy offense. Why? Because God is protecting the stream of blessing that will come to the world through the Jewish nation. I hope we understand at this point in time that all of the blessings that we have as Gentile Christians would not exist had it not been for God strategically using the nation of Israel. Jesus was not a Southern Baptist, amen? Nor Methodist, nor Presbyterian, he was Jewish to the core. This book, I can't even find a Southern Baptist author in this whole book, the Bible. Every single author of this book was Jewish. The only one they even debate anymore is Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts. And I think at the end of the day, to be honest with you, we're going to discover that Dr. Luke was Jewish too. I mean, he's got to be Jewish. He's a doctor. Amen? (laughs) And the millennial kingdom that's coming will not be headquartered in Washington, D.C. It will be headquartered in Jerusalem, in, in Zion. And God knew the blessings that would come to the world through Israel. And he knew the satanic plot to destroy Israel from the get-go. And so he built into these Abrahamic promises protection. A light offense against the Jewish people will bring heavy retaliation for me. By the way, think about that the next time you vote for someone for office. And try to figure out what do they think about Israel. Because that determines whether we as America is in, are on the stream of divine blessing or cursing. I'm kind of the persuasion that we're moving more in the direction of the latter. And it's just a matter of getting back to the Bible The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me, amen? And seeing what God thinks, not what the politicians think, what does God think? And I'm going to support whether it's politicians or churches or theologians that honor what God says. Because at the end of the day, I don't know if I want to come under a heavy offense from God himself. Arnold Fruchtenbaum sort of summarizes the content of the 
verses that we have been studying this morning. He says, therefore, contrary to Isaac's expectations or hope, the Abrahamic covenant was to be sustained through Jacob and not through Esau. Thus, Isaac blessed Jacob, and this was the result of divine intervention in spite of Jacob's sin. Jacob's is in sin here, but God's purpose still goes forward. That's sovereignty. Which means we can totally mess things up, and God's purpose at the end of the day is still going to be accomplished. Not that we don't bear temporal consequences for bad choices. You're, as, as the story unfolds here, you're going to see Jacob experiencing terrible consequences. Because he simply didn't wait on God. He took matters into his own hands. But the big picture, the overarching blueprint of God, goes forward in spite of human ability to mess things up. Amen? See, you, you may mess something up, you may not mess something up, but God's work is going to get done. I'm a sort of path of least resistance guy myself. I want to walk under his authority. He concludes and he says, Isaac blessed Jacob against his own will. As indeed later Balaam, as they're coming out of Egypt, will bless Israel against his own will. This is a magnificent study on so many levels. Deception, how it happens. The sovereignty of God. How God is sovereign and his plan will be fulfilled. It's a, it's a tremendous lesson on wanting to be a blessing to the Jewish people and not a curse. I'll bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Does that relate to salvation? It does relate to salvation because unless you bless a particular descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a man named Jesus Christ, how do you bless Jesus Christ? You believe in, you believe him. You trust your eternity to him. Unless you bless him by believing in him, you in turn cannot be blessed to go to heaven. If you curse Jesus Christ, how would you curse Jesus Christ? By ignoring him, rejecting his free offer of salvation, then you come under the curse where you spend eternity separated from God. Do you see how salvation itself is bound up in this statement? Cursed those who curse you. Blessed are the ones who bless you. Do you want to be blessed? Do you want to go to heaven upon death or the rapture? Then bless a particular descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a man named Jesus Christ. God has no grandchildren. You cannot live off the faith of your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents. You have to exercise your own faith into the person of Jesus Christ. We're inviting people, even now as I am speaking, to do that. As the Holy Spirit convicts people, either in the building or listening online, or listening to the archive after the fact, as the Holy Spirit convicts people of their need to trust in Jesus for salvation, we're trusting that many, many people will be doing that. Becoming a, a Christian, as we've said before, is not a 12-step program. There's one step where you come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit who makes you aware of your need to trust Christ and the best you understand and the best you know how you extend faith, which means trust, into Jesus Christ. And the moment you do that, you become a child of God, just like that. It's not something you have to walk an aisle to do, join a church to do, give money to do. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord where you just say, yes, Lord, you're, you're right. I've been persuaded that this gospel is true, and I'm now fulfilling a singular condition. 
fulfilling a single verb, I am believing, which is another way of saying trusting in what you have done. And that and that alone is what secures your eternity. You're now in the stream of divine blessing. Because you blessed by trusting in him, a particular descendant of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The man, Jesus Christ, if it's something that you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for this um, event that happened 2,000 years before the time of Christ. We're grateful for the, the lessons that it teaches us in our time and in our age. I pray that you would help us uh, understand these things and walk them out this week. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.